So good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers, basically the Germans here, for giving me the chance to present some of uh, our results. And uh, I will be uh, talking, as announced by the chairman, about the modification of uh, multi-terminal supercounting weak links. So we'll change a bit of a, of a topic. And, uh, and this uh, subject is actually uh, in the, I mean, it's not changed in the slide. I can start dancing if you want <laughs> to entertain you. No, no, no. Laser was nice. You adapt to my time, right? <laughs> I will skip the last slide, don't worry. <laughs> No, um, I can talk for an hour about this slide, but <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, I'm uh, pointing you. I can shoot you with the laser as well. Okay, it's not the speaker. That's already a good sign. <laughs> you can start clapping and we gain some time. If you change with the finger, it works well as well. Eh? No, I, they, no, I say change the slide and you just. Trying as hard as I can, yeah. Nixon, nothing happened. the finger on the keyboard uh, it's like my work yeah. change the speaker as well <laughs> oh a no pointer okay I will use my hand <laughs> so and now it works okay Let's go again. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, let me see. Yeah, it looks like going in the good direction. Very good, all right. So let me start by uh, thanking the uh, collaborators. Uh, this uh, project we were running for six years already, so many people were collected on the way who helped us to, uh, to develop this technique I'm gonna talk about. And, and mainly I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Van de Vondel and his group here uh, who uh, helped us to uh, also develop this at the beginning. Um, um, and let's go to the point. So I've been talking about electromigration. So something for those who know very well, there is no need for introduction. Here I'm just say a few words. So the idea is very simple. You apply, you have a metal, you apply a high current to the metal or a high electric field. And then you are able to move atoms with that high current. That can be either because your electrons are producing a wind we actually push out the atoms from the side, or it could be that actually the electric field is so big that the ions in the lattice can move away. 
So uh, and that's what basically we do uh, to modify the properties of superconductors. And the first question you might wonder is why we don't see this effect in daily life. Uh, and that happens because if you go to your household appliances, basically you just apply a small current density and you reach already the melting, or above the melting temperature, and, and then you don't see electromigration. You just chill heat your system and you melt it and that's it. So in order to reach this electromigration regime, you had to go to small devices. So in that case, heat evacuation is very efficient, and, and then you can go much higher in current and actually never reaching the melting, uh, but start moving atoms before you reach the melting. And that's the regime we are working on, so we work with the small devices to, uh, to be able to get to high current densities. So we have done in the past several applications of that, though basically you just make a constriction of your sample, you heat up, and then you start moving atoms and you change the properties. And then so we have like generated uh, uh, gaps, for example, in ferromagnets and uh, conductors, and we have uh, also tuned the properties of superconducting qubits, in this case, uh, niobium or aluminum. Uh, we um, even, it's, it's a sort of a reversible process. You can, uh, in this case, in aluminum, we, we just, uh, you know, move atoms and increase the resistance and then invert, invert the current direction and put them back again in the same place and remove it again and put them back and remove it. And we do that thousands and thousands of times and it's nicely reproducible. So you can do even a, a sort of a memory device with this system. So what I'm going to talk today is more about multi-terminal device. So far I show you only the case of two terminal devices and I show you the case of a single atomic element uh, device. I'm going to show you today multi-terminal and what happens when you have several atoms in the system. So multi-terminals has been, uh, I mean, it's becoming sort of fashionable today. There are many, many applications. You see more than two contacts in a, in a conductor, a superconductor. So some examples here is this itron device. You can control the current uh, by, uh, by uh, applying voltages to different branches or injection of quasi-particles in squids to modulate the properties. Or more recently, three junctions were able to um, uh, somehow uh, um, tune the properties uh, depending on where the electrons are coming from, different junctions and showing and, and exhibiting some even entanglement effects on that. So as you might see, all this requires quite some complicated uh, nanofabrication processing, um, particularly in this case of you see multi layers with 2D electron uh, gases and stuff like that. So I'm going to show you that we can do that, perhaps easier, by just using electromigration. So I'm going to go for this example. We just take uh, uh, three junctions. We apply current from plus to minus, so uh, high potential electrical potential lower, and then we have half of the current going in these two leads and most of the current concentrated at this spot, and then we can locally modify the properties on that point. That's basically the, the idea. So let's start from this uh, junction here. This is an aluminum three junctions you see over here. We apply the current from these upper two contacts. They are, you know, on the same equipotential and towards this one. So basically we are going to pass mainly the higher current density is going to be there. So if you simulate it, you see that you heat up only locally over there. Um, and the idea is to see whether we can modify the properties uh, over there. So we measure then the resistance, for example, with this is junction one, we call it, two and three. And then we measure the voltage between one and three. And, and that's what we get the resistance one, three, and then we just apply current. So this is just resistance goes up because it's sure heating and eventually you start to modify your material, become very, very vertical and you can actually uh, be, have to be careful to not to burn it out. So um, uh, this is the result. So we, we just measure afterwards. Once we have modified, we apply a small current. For example, if you want to measure one, two between these two contacts, you measure resistance one and resistance two. So you measure resistance one and two. You can measure between this and this. You have one and three, or you can measure between two and three between this contact and this contact, and you have two and three. And they are, you know, both of them are entangled in one measurement. But this is a linear system. So uh, if you just consider resistance I, C, um, J, you have just the linear addition. So basically you have three data with three linear equations. So you can 
deconvolve this or solve the problem and isolate each of them. Okay. Um, and that shows, for example, in this particular case, R1, R2 is very similar in the normal state. R3 is a bit higher because this is a bit narrower. So this is expected, no problem at all. So now we can start modifying. So first thing we do is we apply current between one and three towards two, so we heat up only that part of the system. So what you have before is in blue for each of the resistance, each of the junctions, and you see after electromigrating this part, it's only that one we modify, the others do not modify at all. It's so very, very target uh, description. So you can even try to measure the critical current between uh, one and two, so you go through that part, you modify, you create a, a junction, and therefore the critical current is reduced and now exhibits Fraunhofer oscillations which uh, correspond well to, a, to a junctions. If you measure between one and three, you never modify anything between one and three, and clearly you nothing happens. Before and after is the same. If you go between two and three, uh, you, you get uh, the same oscillations. So you can go farther and say, well, I modify already two, and now I want to modify one. So I want to modify that one without touching two and three, and this is exactly what happens. So before is the last state here, and after, you see, we just modify this one, go up in resistance, we modify that junction. Nothing happened in two, nothing happened in three, and once again, same behavior, and we can do it now. We want to modify three and don't touch the other two. It's exactly the same. And it can go on and go on for as many, you know, ways or times or iterations you want. So if you want to see what's going on in the sample, um, at the end, this is AFM images showing that uh, basically we're in this case trying to modify the second junction here and then you see how you start to build up a bit of material over there. This is a very, very, how to say, aggressive electromigration. Uh, this is really are pushing atoms out of the place and, and, and uh, as you can see in the AFM. Um, now I'm going to show you what happened if we go for a mild electromigration, very, very tiny amount of current, but enough to uh, modify this. So in this research actually is unpublished, we try to first of all address the influence of the geometry uh, for mild electromigration. So this is our device, so we apply current, let's say between this and this is the same IQ potential, and we go to this part, and so we modify that junction over there. And then we change this angle of the junction from 90, 80, 70, and we'll show how electromigration propagates depending on the geometry of, of your device, okay? So uh, I'll go very quickly on the procedure. In this case, we apply uh, current pulses, uh, I was, uh, and then we measure after the current pulse let's say once you have modified your, your system with high current and at the poles as well when you have the, uh, the Schul heat in full power. So unfortunately the colors are not very well chosen here. So actually the, when you measure in the blue is the red and when you measure in the red is the blue. It was too simple so I tried to confuse a little bit. So, so look, at, look at the red, I think it's the most interesting one which is, don't forget that the blue. Okay, so the red is measure the resistance after you modify the junction. So it should be, if you don't modify, it should be a constant curve. So what you observe is uh, basically at the beginning you improve the, uh, the resistance. The system becomes better. And that has to do probably with, I mean, you might imagine releasing of a stress on the, on the shaft or, or some degassing or something. So we try to go above that and try to go above the initial resistance, but not more than 10%. So we just modify a little bit uh, each of the junctions I show you in this case, okay? And then we take a picture for that. And this is what you see in the scanning electron microscope using the Everhart only uh, detector, AC2, and you barely see anything actually. You did not modify, you had impression in the SAM, your junction. But if you look at the in-lens detector, you clearly see that there is uh, a whiter part, let's say, coming from the part you modified, okay? And that looks like you increase the yield of electrons coming from the sample, okay? Um, so, and in order to tackle that, we say, well, well, if it's that, probably we reduce the work function on the sample, okay? So we'll try to do some uh, Kelvin Pro microscopy, um, and this is indeed the case. We see that the, uh, uh, the, the 
work function has decreased exactly. But the, what is interesting is now we are able to control with the, with the geometry of the sample the extension of how much you modify. Okay, so depending on the angle of your, you can change that. So you might have a good junction here and not a, good, a very long junction there or something like that. So that's just to show a bit of control. Um, the, the question is why the work function is decreased. They have been. I mean, can go on on discussion about that. There have been a couple of works showing that it's always the case if you heat up a little bit the uh, niobium, you have some uh, um, fissorption of um, oxygen and carbon, and that tends to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, reduce the, the work function of the sample. Okay. Um, so we did some uh, uh, quick simulations where we take into account uh, the heating produced by the current, the heat evacuation uh, in the sample itself. Um, we also take into account the heat evacuations through the substrate. Um, by choosing the proper parameters, we are able to fit for each of the junctions um, the, uh, the, 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 the resistance uh, measured during the pulse, uh, which contains the, the Joule heating, that's the important part. And with that, we can model actually the temperature distribution in our sample and predict the extension. And we can even say uh, what temperature the we stop modifying the niobium. And this is about 430 Kelvin, uh, which seems to be the point where diffusion of oxygen happen in these structures. Okay, but we go farther inside there, so we. This is the 400 is just the border. If you go to the middle, you are about 570 or something like that. This is roughly the estimations from uh, the simulations. Um, okay, so now I change gears here. I'm going to change a bit of a topic. We'll see. So far, we have seen how we can modify a, a single elemental material. In that case, was uh, an iodium. I'm going to go now to the case we have a very complex material, several atoms. Uh, we wonder which atom are we going to move with the current, okay? So for that, I took uh, um, a complex um, superconducting material, YBCO, which is, uh, as you might see, full of different atoms. And the question is, if I play a high current, which of all these atoms I'm going to move, okay? So if you go back to the uh, literature, you actually realize that the current in these systems go through what is uh, these uh, copper oxygen planes and also through the copper oxygen chains, unidimensional. And actually most of the current, I mean these guys uh, back in the 90s, they measure single crystals, so there are no twinnings, um, uh, untwinned single crystals, and they measure in direction of only the change can carry the current, or, uh, or sorry, only the planes can carry current, or in the direction B, where both the change and the planes can carry current. And out of these uh, measurements, they conclude that 40% of the, cur the current goes through the planes, and 60% goes to the chains. And the chains are interesting because this, that means that you might have a high current density here, and, uh, uh, sorry, it was a bit too fast. Oh, um, um, most of the current goes through this one, and this oxygen you see over there, it can easily jump out and locate it in between these two copper. Okay, uh, that's the idea we have in mind, and that's the thing we're trying to to move. So, and this is interesting because if you are only able to move one atom, the oxygen, you are able to change the distribution of oxygen in the system, and by doing that, is well known that you can change the um, the, uh, the whole doping in the system, and then you can actually uh, scan the whole phase diagram of this system by just using current, okay? You don't need to do several samples with different doping, you just apply current and change the oxygen. And that was a bit the idea. So quickly uh, done, this is uh, our sample. And the sample, the, it has multi-terminals, so uh, this is an important point. So we have a central bridge, which is narrower. That's the one that is going to be affected the most. And then we have two bridges at the side, uh, and then we can actually monitor each of them to see in which direction we are pushing the atoms, okay? Um, um, I always confused with that. So let's see what happened. So we have, first of all, we measured the uh, critical temperature. 
as a function of how many times we try to move the oxygen atoms, so the, what we call electromigration run. So the, uh, this part of the bridge uh, in red to the left is what we call measure one, B1, B2 is here. The central bridge is two, three, and the uh, left is three, four. So the current is going in this direction, okay, from right to left. So we are pushing oxygen vacancies towards the left side, okay? So, uh, and if you look at the, uh, how the, um, the voltage changes, so you see that the blue part is basically not changing much, and one and two and, th two and three are changing substantially. And this is because you are actually moving oxygen from here, uh, oxygen vacancy from here to here, and then you are depleting the oxygen here, and then superconducting properties becomes uh, weaker, and that's why uh, TC goes uh, down, okay? So this is underdope uh, YVCO, and this is a bit overdope. So I don't know why the slides are changing long, but um, so here is we do the same device, but then we measure the whole voltage. Now the region which is colored over there, and then we see that actually between uh, three and seven, this one, we see that the carrier density mainly has a tendency to increase, while in this case, it has a tendency to decrease uh, the system. So that also proof that we are moving oxygen vacancies to this side and oxygen to the other side. And we can even from this data, put it on the phase boundary, and it goes more or less okay with what is published uh, in the literature. So showing that is a way to do it. So this is showing uh, also that how we are moving this oxygen. Um, for to, to, to check that, we use uh, Raman uh, measurements. So the idea is like um, more you have the um, oxygen uh, vacancies on the system, higher is this uh, delta. And when delta is higher, the C-axis of the unit cells become longer, extended, and then the phonon modes become softer, okay? And the frequency goes down. So the idea is to check the phonon modes which are pointed out with the blue arrows here and try to see uh, how they change as a function of position. So we check the Raman in these uh, spots that you see green in the, along the bridge. We take the pristine sample and we see this is sort of monolithic. Um, this sample is constant, so we can even get how many oxygens we have over there. And then we electromigrate once and you see that how in the central region you deplete that. So here is the frequency of the Raman mode that you translate to the oxygen content. So you see how the oxygen content go down. In and if you continue electromigration, you see how this propagate to the left, okay? So you have less and, uh, less, and less oxygens coming to this side of the sample. So basically we are once again pushing oxygen back and here, oxygens to the other side. So um, we can even do, you know, back and forth current. So these are the three bridges, color code is here, one, two is red, central is green, and on the right, three, four is blue. So we apply current, let's say positive current, uh, which means flowing, flowing from right to left, and then we apply 5.8 milliamps, and you see on one, two, the resistance goes up. That means oxygen vacancies are arriving, while the green goes down and the blue goes down, means oxygen are, are arriving on that the other side, so we are changing vacancy here, oxygen there, and, oi, sorry, um, oi, yeah. And then we, we just apply current constant, and here we suddenly change to minus. So we invert the current direction, and you see how you now bring, so resistance goes down, so we bring to this side oxygens, and this one increases, and then decreases, I'll explain in a second. This one increases, so we are bringing oxygen vacancies here, and what you see going up and down is because it's the passage of oxygen vacancies and oxygen atoms counter flow in one direction to the other, okay? And then we reverse the current again, and then, uh, yeah, well it's, it's, it's the same story as you might see, it's very reproducible. So we can bring oxygens from one point to the other, back and forth, back and forth, and that's all, okay? And what you see in the middle is just the passage of, of these oxygen atoms. So um, we can go uh, farther. 
and we can image that because when you have a depletion of oxygen uh, in the YVCO, reflectivity goes up. So if you just look at the optical microscope, you see it brighter. And this is exactly what we see. So this is initial stage, and then we push oxygen vacancies to this side, and what you see like brighter is where oxygen is missing, okay? And then we put it to the other side, and yeah, and back and forth. You don't see it much here. I have a nice movie to show you. You have to take differential images, and then you see uh, how this is changing as a function of time, basically. And these waves sometimes comes because of the context, because they produce current crowding at the context, and the, the current density is not homogeneous. So we have even uh, simulated these results uh, recently, and I guess I'm, I'm going to close in the next two slides. Um, so uh, quickly done. I wanted to show you that we went beyond YVCO. We tried LSMO, which is a, a ferromagnetic material, but it's a very peculiar manganite system where you only have, uh, let's say, good conductivity if you have high magnetization, okay? So this is double exchange mechanism. I will not go through the details, but the only way you can get um, this manganite like a decent conductor is to go to low temperatures. <laughs> so the only way to, to do this effect is to go to 100 kelvins, for example, and then we see for the first time also how we move the uh, vacancies over there. Another feature we observe in this case is this is happening just before you have the dielectric breakdown and then you generate uh, cracks in your STO substrate. I will not go into the detail that you can also uh, nicely uh, visualize optically, but I, will, I think it's a bit too much for this talk. So I just put my conclusions. Uh, I think we have uh, uh, an accessible and powerful technique for modulation of your superconducting devices. And you can do many things with that, from uh, gaps to uh, cleaning your samples, um, you know, fabricating mem resistors, nano gap, point contacts. Um, it might be reversible depending on the system. And um, yeah, you know, it's up to you to find the application as well. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, that's, I mean, getting over dope is difficult. Uh, that's <laughs> uh, so on that side, we just see a very mild increase of TC. Uh, no, 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 we didn't see m much more than that. We didn't see any decrease of TC. What we believe is like this process, if, um, if you follow it for a longer time, um, this is just a little bit, but you will see that there is a tendency on both sides to go up, actually. So I think we are also losing oxygen from the system. Uh, you know, so it's, but I don't think we really get over dope uh, much, but probably you have the effect in this. Okay, thanks. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, my question is about this reversibility process, actually. You have showed us data with the resistance. Uh, do you think you can also reverse the process where you showed the niobium junction formation, for example, appearing and reappearing the, of this Fraunhofer pattern? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Look, uh, we try that, and you see an improvement when you inverse the current, so definitely you heal a little bit but it's very fragile. We end up, uh, you have to control it very carefully. I don't know why, but the sample end up exploding at a certain moment. As so a follow-up question, I'm so yeah. sorry. Uh, so did you do elemental analysis of those junctions, for example, XPS or EDS analysis, to see that this is not actually oxidization, but a migration? Because no. you're heating uh, the niobium up? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, we have tried, we don't have any conclusive information. We have tried a, a bit of atom probe, 
Uh, we have tried, uh, I think, uh, also the XBS, but uh, don't have a clear uh, conclusion. The point is, there are small, really small sanctions, you know, and sometimes in the, uh, for the techniques we have, it's not that That's it, thank big you. <laughs> to get the data. Niobium 50 nanometers. 50, yes, yes, yes. I oh, think I can take one more, eh? Oh, yeah, perhaps, perhaps, why not? I never thought about that. Yeah, in, in, some, in some sense, what I show like a momentum restore was in, in that direction, you know, that the fact that we could change the resistance of the device. Um, and we did it for several thousand times, but it's tricky. Eventually, it's always irreversible, ir uh, sorry, irreversible. You know, at the end of the day, uh, you can do it for a thousand times, but perhaps not for a million times. Yeah. No, no, but that's a good direction. Yes. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, all, all the analysis that you did, uh, was it was that in situ, like uh, like the SEM imaging where you showed that the work function and the like Kelvin probe? All that's it. Uh, that's ex situ. Ex situ. Yeah, so but the SEM we have uh, the, the, the 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 optical imaging that's in situ. This is in situ. Uh huh. So it's an optical cryostat, and uh, you pass the current while you observe, and we also have uh, SEM images in situ as well. So we put, put current while imaging with the SEM as well. I see, and you don't see a difference then when you expose it to air afterwards? No, no. I mean, uh -huh. there the is probably difference, eh? but the, it, uh, probably it's the next term in the Taylor. I see, <laughs> I see. Thank you.